Hi, I'm Kathy Frazier, and I'm here to talk about a really serious topic, but hopefully give you some tips on how you might think about it to make it better. You know, we see it certainly in entertainments that we've seen with the Me Too movement. We've seen it in politics. We've seen it in sports. And yes, while it's a little bit quieter, we see it in healthcare. The topic sexual harassment. Healthcare is actually an area where it's got the dynamics that make sexual harassment very possible. There's a differential of power. There is usually a physician or somebody, whether it's in the, the operating room or someone with patients, really have the knowledge, the skills, and is typically have a significant power. And then you have others, whether it's the nurses, the techs, the patients, that could actually be uh, not in that position of power. And that dynamic actually creates a situation where sexual harassment can happen. And it may not even be aware by the accused, but it certainly is gonna be felt by the victim. Now, in 2017, 18, the Me Too movement made this a lot more apparent. It became transparent, people were very aware, and organizations, including Mayo Clinic, really started to amp up the dialogue on it. We made sure that people knew this was unacceptable. We did a lot of communication as other organizations did to say, this is the standard, this is unacceptable, and we need you to report it if this is happening. Well, you would hope that things have gotten better. And at least at Mayo Clinic, we've certainly brought awareness and we have seen the number of cases stable, but it's not gone. And that's what makes me incredibly motivated to actually do more. Until we eliminate sexual harassment, we are not to be complacent. We need to continue to focus on this. So I'm really pleased with some of the training and the learning programs that we have put in place to keep the dialogue going, to keep people thinking about what is right and what is not. And I'm confident that over time, we may not eliminate sexual harassment, but certainly it will become a very rare event. So we have done a lot of things um, in this space, including publishing a document in the proceedings, which is a peer reviewed journal that talks about how we addressed this issue of sexual harassment and continue to do so. So I'm pleased to share kind of our journey thus far with sexual harassment on the side of learning, training, and creating a culture that really supports our value of respect. Back in 2018, we did the, I'd call it more training that you'd expect. We had some online modules, we had great policies, these kind of things. But come 2018, we knew that we had to do it differently because what we were seeing were reports that were not just clear violations or sexual harassment situations, but it was a bit at the margin. They were things like humor in the operator room, for example, and humor, I would say, that was distasteful, but sometimes the culture was tolerating it. It was something like an example, um, a physician in the operating room would look to a tech that was someone he had worked with for many years and look at her and say, wow, your eyes look red. You must have had a really late night last night in kind of a fun way. Now that's could be funny, but it certainly is inappropriate relative to the many other people in the room and that victim there that may have said, that just doesn't feel right. Is that sexual harassment? Is that a microaggression? Part of that is uh, an illegal question on what it is, but clearly it's not a respectful behavior. So we've actually expanded our training to go away from just the classic, what is harassment and what do you do, into to how do we really create a culture of respect in all areas? When a sexual harassment situation or something that looks like it is a, a violation of mutual respect, we always look at kind of four different roles. We talk about the accused. We talk about the victim. We talk about the bystander because oftentimes this is witnessed. And lastly, we talk about the supervisor. And part of our learning is try to change those roles. So if you are the accused, can you make that accused into someone who can really think about it as an opportunity? Maybe for 20 or 30 years, the person has had the same behaviors and no one's ever said anything. Now that's not an excuse at all, but using that as an opportunity to describe to the person what they did, how it made other people feel, and other alternative ways that they could actually change their behavior, that's actually creating a accused into a possibility of an opportunity for improved behavior. Second of all, let's talk about the victim. The victim, I hear this too frequently, which people say, well, I didn't want to make a lot of fuss about it. I was okay. You know, I kind of thought about it and I decided it was better just to put it aside. But when you talk to the victim and say, 
could you be an advocate? Because I know that you are brave and that you're going to kind of, you feel it's okay to actually just make it go away and let time heal. But for all those people in front of you now that actually may be subject to that sexual harassment or, or microaggression, can you be an advocate? Can you help that? And we have found when people think about not just themselves, but the others, that's really where they might engage. And there's that bystander. The bystander, the good friend, after a situation like this, it's kind of easy to go over to someone. Well, maybe it's not easy, but it's, it, you can go over to someone and say, you know, I saw that happen. I feel really bad for you. If you want to talk about it, let me know. That's great friendship. But if you could be an ally, if you could reinvent yourself to be an ally, where you are going in front of that situation while it's happening, said, hey, that doesn't sound right. I'm not, you know, I'm not very comfortable with that. And, you know, I, I really wish that perhaps you might change your language a bit because it doesn't feel very good to me. You've addressed it right in that moment. You're standing in front of the victim and you're really helping that accused perhaps to actually change their behavior. And lastly, you've got your supervisor. Your supervisor, well, they could certainly be a good listener and say, yes, let me show you how to report to the compliance hotline. Let me introduce you to HR because it sounds like this is something you want to report. Certainly, you're checking the box and doing your job. But a supervisor that can be your navigator, that can actually help you think through, what does this do to you? How is your well-being? How are you feeling? And then help you navigate through a process that is quite difficult. That's being a real hero, and that's being a navigator. So I encourage you in these situations to think about these flipping the roles. Can accused become opportunities? Can victims become advocates? Can bystanders be allies? And can supervisors be navigators? That's my challenge to you. So I'd like to summarize with some things that you can do. What is it that you can do differently starting today or maybe reinforce the things you're already doing? The first thing is set the tone. Be a role model. So when you're seeing something happen, absolutely act in the moment. Be that role model. Be that advocate. Be that navigator. Be that ally. Right? Or certain cases, if perhaps you've done something, be that opportunity. The second thing I'd say is keep, keep the discussion going. That means, you know, don't just have this interesting video, pay it forward. When you're at the next staff meeting, perhaps have a conversation. If you're with some other people and you see something, bring it to the table. If we can keep the conversation going, it actually becomes a part of how we think about things. And lastly, I want to talk a little tip about what we call a professional pivot. You know, I've done this as well, where I've done something, I've said something, maybe I thought it was funny, and I later go and say, oh, I'm not sure if that person took it that way, and it could keep me up all night thinking, I may have been a misinterpreted, I feel bad about this, et cetera. Well, certainly you could just let time heal, but you can also say, you know what, let me own that. I'm gonna go call that person up and say, you know, I may have offended you. I've been thinking about this a bit, and what I said may was, was perhaps inappropriate, and I just wanna let you know that I." I apologize for that, and I really hope that um, you will, will, will take this apology and you know, I will do better. And it is amazing the element of both being able to do that and be able to own your behaviors, but also create a path for healing if that victim, who perhaps knew they were a victim, maybe they didn't, at least has an understanding of where you're coming from. The next thing we suggest you do is to pay it forward. Paying it forward means things like becoming a mentor, becoming an advocate. It actually means intervening and advocating when you can. And lastly, it means looking at the values of mutual respect and whether it's in sexual harassment and microaggressions or anything else. It's saying, how do you constantly think about putting that mutual respect in action? So I wanna end by just saying thank you. Collectively, all take action. If we all do what I've suggested, we can actually minimize the sexual harassment and microaggressions that happen in our day-to-day -day world, and it becomes a safer place for all of us. <laughs>